Hey folks, we're gonna get started in just a few moments. Um, I'm gonna need to duck out just for a second and our Chief Learning Officer, Angela Stopper is actually gonna be introducing Allie and Kyle this morning. Angela, you've got the script in your chat. I'm so sorry, Allie and Kyle, you're gonna do great. I'm gonna be right back with you in a few moments. So thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. As Colin said, my name is Angela Stopper and I'm your Chief Learning Officer on campus. Um, Let's see. So I want to, to let you know I'll be here um, to moderate for you today. And I have the pleasure of wel welcoming our Coaching Fundamentals presenters from Better Up. Uh, please note we'll be providing the slides and a recording of the session to everyone on the main NOW conference website after the conference is concluded. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize Better Up as th for their contribution to Berkeley in the NOW conference as our presenting sponsor. So thank you so much for for your support and, and supporting this conference in that way. BetterUp's mission is to unlock greater potential, purpose, and passion. And we are really honored to have Allie and Kyle from BetterUp with us today. Not only is BetterUp you know, the presenting sponsors I mentioned, they also provide coaching licenses uh, as part of our raffle prize and are one of UC Berkeley's vendors through our Berkeley People Management Executive Coaching Program, providing executive coaching to over 50 man managers annually here at UC Berkeley. In today's session, uh, you will be muted. Please add any questions you have to the chat and you can message me directly if you have uh, any questions that you would wish me to ask if you want to remain anonymous to our speakers or to the other guests here in the room. There is closed captioning available, so please click on the CC box at the bottom of your screen to, to, to show your subtitles. And with that, I'm happy to introduce our presenters. Kyle is a solutions consultant with BetterUp, where he leverages his background in behavioral science to provide actionable insights that advance organizations' talent capabilities. Kyle's passionate about helping organizations make informed, data-driven decisions with deep experience consulting in the areas of leadership development, employee engagement, performance management, among other areas. Kyle holds a PhD in industrial organizational psychology from Colorado State University and currently resides um, an hour south of Denver, Colorado, where he enjoys backpacking, skiing, cycling in the Rocky Mountains. And Ali is a solutions consultant socializing in the design and implementation of interventions to promote positive growth and development in employees and in organizations to which they belong. Ali has an MA and a PhD in industrial organizational psychology from the University of Akron. Her consulting experience spans a wide variety of industries, including her education, technology, manufacturing and warehousing, agriculture, con um, construction, uh, insurance, and nonprofits, particularly environmental and youth services. She manages advanced analytics and research in John Deere's Global Human Resource Organization, a role where she worked closely with Deere's C-suite and senior business leaders on talent strategy, the future of work, diversity and inclusion initiatives, and most recently, she led the human capital practices area within the Butler Business Consulting Group, a management consulting firm based out of the Lacey School of Business at Butler University. Allie regularly facilitates workshops and presents at national and international conference on topics, including talent analytics and performance enablement. And so with that, I am going to turn the floor over to our wonderful presenters and our presenting sponsors for the conference, Kyle and Allie, uh, please take it away. Thanks so much for that introduction, Angela. We're so pleased to be partners with Berkeley and to be here with you today. Really looking forward to this. Kyle, is there anything you'd like to add before we move forward? No, absolutely echo what you said, Allie. Pleased to be with you all today and, and looking forward to diving into coaching fundamentals. Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm Allie and I'll be co-facilitating this session with Kyle. I was a psychology professor, and it is a particular source of joy to be here with you today. I'm also studying, working on being a coach through Georgetown's Institute for Transformational Leadership. So this is uh, such a topic that's near and dear to me as a psychologist, as a scientist practitioner, and and to extend the focus to all of us here, I just want to convey how deeply grateful that Kyle and I are that you've decided to be with us today. We welcome each and every one of you 
and, and are really appreciative for your interest in coaching fundamentals. Looking forward to learning from and with you as we talk about ways to impl implement coaching behavior into our daily interactions. If you're open to it, I'd love to start us with a very short centering exercise. You may have practiced this in your lives or you may have not. And so I just invite you to be comfortable with, with any discomfort. And this will take just a few minutes of time. So will get us in the headspace for the rest of our time today. And so this is again, a three minute mindful breath awareness exercise. I'll walk you through it. Let's get started. Let's begin by sitting in a quiet place with the spine comfortably straight, but not rigid. Sitting in a posture that feels dignified, whatever that means to you. Feel free to be on camera or off eyes open or closed. Just notice what feels most comfortable to you. Notice how you're sitting without judging yourself. Feel your feet on the floor. Feel your legs, your hips, torso, arms. Feel your chest, your face and bring your attention to the physical sensations of breathing with a sense of curiosity and openness. Feeling the breath come in and go out, accepting things as they are in this moment. Follow the breath as it comes into the body. Observe and feel the breath without judgment. Notice the slight pause between the in and out breath and follow the out breath, noticing that the out breath turns into the in breath. Be with the sensations of breathing. When you notice that the mind has wandered away, from its attention on the breath, gently yet firmly, bring the wandering mind back to the direct bodily sensation of breathing. Avoid making yourself into a failure or giving yourself grief. Pivot your feelings instead and generate a feeling of being okay and accepting yourself as you are. Each time the mind wanders, again, gently yet firmly, bring your mind back to the sensation of the breath. Noticing the in-breath and the out-breath from the very first sensation of the breath coming into the body to the very last sensation of the breath leaving the body. When you're finished, stretch gently, thanking yourself. If that was your first ever mindful breathing exercise, congrats. Proud of you if it felt funny or funky, totally get that invite you to consider making it a part of your daily life. A really nice way to potentially transition between meetings. I had 15 meetings yesterday and definitely needed to do that a time or two. So thank you. I'm really looking forward to getting underway. Kyle, anything from you before we move forward? I would say thank you, Allie. I did not know I needed that until we were doing it. So <laughs> I feel, <laughs> and I hope I speak for a, a lot of our audience. So thank you.
really my pleasure. Appreciate everyone's openness to it. And hopefully you're getting a sense for Kyle and I in, in terms of style, really open, really eager to hear from you. Love chats coming in. We welcome questions. I'm I'm really comfortable with interruptions, actually interrupting. Um, is part of, of building coaching capacity. Um, and, and really, if you want to say something, ask something, please feel free to come off mute and do so. Um, this is a space for us to learn and grow and think and experiment together. So without further ado, let's go. And Kyle will be controlling the slides also. So Kyle, thank you for sharing your screen and pushing click and doing all those important, oh, so important things. Hard work, but someone has to do it. <laughs> awesome. All right. So what we're going to be doing in this first section is I'll spend a few minutes laying some groundwork for the power of coaching. And so beginning with the end in mind, we'll talk about from the standpoint of empirical evidence, what we know about the impact coaching delivers. You heard me use the phrase beginning with the end in mind. And so we are very interested at Better Up and Beyond in how coaching as an intervention delivers very tangible, measurable impact through improvements in a variety of domains, in mindsets such as self-awareness and growth mindset, in outcomes such as job performance, in skills such as how we communicate, which is an absolutely foundational aspect of how we relate with others and how we lead, whether we have direct reports or not, formal or informal leadership, coaching fuels our effectiveness with that, how we set and meet our goals, and more holistically, how we live, how we feel as though we thrive and are effective in this world at large, which has been really hard for so many of us in this pandemic period. And coaching is helpful in driving positive growth in all of those arenas. And if we turn, if we allow our attention to turn for a moment to the financial arena, which frankly is an important arena to consider as constrained budgets are being invested into powerful interventions like coaching is, we know that coaching works from a financial metrics perspective. It's associated with increased revenue, success in attaining revenue targets. And I, um, we did not commit a typo. There are multiple studies, starting with a 2009 study sponsored by the International Coaching Federation and many um, ensuing bodies of work that cite the median return on investment or ROI of coaching at a somewhat uh, astonishing 700%. Coaching delivers impact. And if, if we translate that into more specific terms, if we get granular about a piece of what we just talked about, coaching and delivering impact, do you recall one of those outcomes we cited was high performance? I think it's really important to start to unpack how we get to impact. And it's through the regular enactment, successful enactment of a few key behaviors. And I'm sorting, I'm citing from one particular uh, research, body of research conducted by CEB on a very large data set of 20,000 employees that pinpoints that if we look at what is accounting for variability in performance, what explains high performance, Three behaviors in particular, providing informal feedback, clarifying expectations, and helping people solve problems is what is really that behavioral mechanism, the set of behavioral pathways that underlie coaching leading to high performance. Just three things have incredible impact there. And so what we're going to be doing, Kyle and I, for the remainder of our time together, is bringing to life, bringing, giving opportunity to practice 
how we can translate these behavioral pathways into our everyday interactions with our teams, with our colleagues. Certainly don't need to limit it to the walls of work with our family members, partners, how we can incorporate coaching practices that are incredibly good at, at drawing our attention to these behaviors here, feedback, clarity of expectations, problem solving. That's where we'll be spending our time. I'd love to invite some of your perspectives at this early juncture. You've heard me for many minutes now, and this is a workshop after all. It's intended to be interactive. And I'd love for us to think about what gets in the way of us walking down those behavioral pathways I just cited. We know, I think all of us fundamentally know and understand that how important these ongoing coaching conversations, the provision of feedback is to inspiring high performance and having high quality relationships with one another. Let's do a bit of a quick bit of brainstorming in the chat. What do you think tends to get in the way and block us from going down those behavioral pathways of having those ongoing conversations? Please feel free to weigh in in the chat. What are any blockers that you've experienced or encountered in others? Thanks, David. Lack of knowledge, Ernestine, miscommunication, anxiety. Ah, being our own worst enemy. Yeah, it's so interesting, centering ourselves in this. Poster syndrome, distrust. Yeah, a lot of references to trust. Good. Mm, I love Nikki. Thanks for calling out the flip of this in terms of how helpful it is to see positive modeling of coaching behaviors. So important to recognize those, call those out, celebrate them. Yeah. Good. And thanks for calling out the time piece, right? It's acknowledgement of intense workloads, turnover, which can impact depth of relationships. Hmm. Nathan, thanks for calling out the energy dynamic here. Yeah. Kyle, anything standing out to you that you'd like to speak to in the chat? I think the time piece resonates with me and it's what I've heard the most from, from managers. You know, we're, we're pulled in so many different directions at work on a day-to-day -day basis. And it might feel as though we're, we're so busy putting out fires and being reactive rather than, than being proactive. And one of the most proactive things you can do with your people is have these kinds of developmental ongoing conversations where you're providing feedback. So that's, that's the one that really stands out to me from a practical point of view. Then also from from a skill building point of view, um, just just folks aren't aren't used to it. You know, they they might not have had coaching in, in their work lives, so they don't know what it looks like, uh, how to how to even broach the subject with their people. And then that's the other piece that I see quite a bit. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. It's a nice job calling out that efficacy component to this. Yeah, our fear of conflict. Yeah, awesome chat contributions. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing those. Let's, let's take a look then at, at how we're, we're thinking about this and, and a few illustrative examples that are not perhaps nearly as impactful as what came in via chat, but just to establish alignment between what we know in practice and from the literature, what have been identified as is key blockers, but that fear piece, the time piece that you spoke to, that Kyle spoke to, right? Something very, uh, if we look at this third circle from the left, there can be a real reluctance to give praise. Some, some individuals harbor an implicit belief that, that praise ought to be reserved for extremely special occasions. And, and uh, we've seen in our research at BetterUp that being a, um, an, a leader, again, whether you have direct reports or not, we were, can all identify as leaders, is 
recognition is even more important as we've navigated COVID in terms of predicting leadership effectiveness. Recognition matters so much now more than ever. And also this clarity piece. We, we talked at the beginning here about how important it is to be clear in one's expectations. There's so often miscommunication as you cited that hinders the ability for two people to connect, to understand one another. And so what Kyle and I would love to do is to talk about some very basic techniques that we can practice that help us overcome these blockers. And we'll do some early celebration and recognition of, of ways, small ways, easy ways um, from a from an effort perspective that we can practice to become just that leader who guides high performance in each and every one of our team members. And those ways are getting to know people as individuals, right? appreciating the uniqueness of each of your coworkers, getting to know them, being clear. We'll talk about how to, how to get better at that offering guidance and support. We've seen in these pandemic laden times how critical it is for leaders to be willing to provide support to their teams. Asking good questions and listening. We'll be spending the bulk of our remaining session together on what that looks like, how we do that well. Providing timely feedback, not waiting. Right? having a problem solving orientation, and finally showing appreciation. Thank you, I appreciate you. Okay. We can just make that part of how we communicate. So seemingly basic and yet important to practice and get more skillful at so it becomes effortless. That's where we're going to go the rest of our time today and Kyle, I'll let you take us there. Thanks, Ellie. Thanks for grounding us with, with some of the outcomes and the benefits that coaching uh, can drive. But I'd like to go back, maybe back a step further. We didn't want to start off the presentation with the, the classic Webster's Dis Dictionary defines coaching as, um, but I did want to spend some time discussing, you know, what is coaching? You know, there's a lot of misconceptions about what coaching is. And a good example came to me a few weeks ago when I'm, I'm guilty of, of browsing the social media website called Reddit quite often. And they did uh, uh, what's called an AMA and ask me anything where there are a couple of coaches that came onto the platform and opened it up for, you know, an ask me anything interview um, set up. And the, the level of questioning and, and honestly vitriol that came at them with people not understanding the fundamentals of coaching and comparing it to, you know, saying that it's a scam, saying that it's, it's stealing people's money through life coaching or saying, it's very similar to therapy for X, Y, Z reasons, um, was, was quite shocking to me. So I think there's a general level of misunderstanding about what coaching is. So I think we, a good place to start would be um, defining what coaching is. And to do that, I'd, I'd love to turn it back to you all in much the same way that Ali just did. Um, and by asking, how would you all define coaching? And I'd, I'd love for you all to, to type out, you know, either a full-fledged definition that you have in the chat or maybe um, just some aspects of good coaching that you recognize and would like to, to add to this working definition. Feel free to enter into the chat. And Ali, I'd ask you to kind of call out anything that's, that's popping up. Absolutely. Yeah. From Shelly, letting people find their way. Love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that recognition that it's within the coachee, right? And the coach's job is to kind of unlock that. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Just scrolling through, processing, right? mm -hmm. the importance of goals in coaching, intentionality, okay. strength-based approaches. Ooh, love that. I was doing a frequency analysis, the word listen would be 
highly a, a top word here. Love that. Well, allowing people to search through their options and experiment through actions and thoughts. That's really nice. And that I agree with you. These are awesome definitions. Really awesome. Mm -hmm. well, thank you all yeah. for participating there. And, and Ali, thanks for reading off just a few of our, our great definitions and, and aspects of the definitions. Before, before I get into a definition, I wanted to talk about a few coaching myths and, and maybe do a bit of busting, myth busting. So the first coaching myth that we see quite often is, you know, coaching is a lot of touchy feely stuff. And this is a perception we bump into quite a bit, especially from folks who um, may have never had or experienced coaching themselves before. And this is also where I think coaching might bump up against therapy in people's minds as in their perceptions. Of course, this isn't necessarily true. So coaching is meant to be above all else, I would say practical. So my, I'll, I'll use an example just from my most recent coaching session. We all get coaches at BetterUp, which is just a fantastic benefit. In my last session, we were dialed in and laser focused on me taking control over my schedule um, and creating habits that will really help me focus a lot more at work. So yeah, we, we delve into my thoughts and mindsets about productivity quite a bit, but at the end of the day, it's about changing behavior. And so it's really dialed in and, and not as much touchy-feely. The second myth, coaching is for people who have something wrong with them. So I, I can't disagree with this one enough. Um, the fact of the matter is we, we all have things to work on. There's no perfect employee that would not benefit from coaching we found. And, and what we see from our data at BetterUp is really strong usage of coaching from high performers. So people who have been identified as high performers within their organization and also employees who are going through uh, quite a bit of change. So people who are more likely to lean into coaching are folks who are going through change and, and this doesn't really necessarily mean that anything is wrong. It just means that they're aware of the need to become more intentional and more focused at work. And the last coaching myth would be coaching is all about uh, giving advice. And we find that it's, it's quite the opposite. And we'll get into this a bit more later, but the most effective coaches do two things very well. And you all identified them, I think. You know, they listen and they ask very, very good questions. And I think this is where coaching also bumps up against um, mentorship, where you see a bit more advice giving uh, than you do with coaching. Coaching, as we talked about, is more around um, guiding people to uncover effective solutions for themselves. So while it's good to have experienced coaches who have kind of walked a certain path before or been there themselves, the goal is not for them to guide through advice, but rather through a, a bit of exploration, self-exploration. So I'll quit yapping and give you a definition. I promised a definition. Here is a definition that we really like. And we like this definition of coaching for three main reasons, I would say. So the first piece is that ongoing and dynamic piece. So it's important to note that coaching is not a one and done event. It's an ongoing relationship. And it's a process that can really shift um, based on what the coachee's pressing needs are. So that's both the ongoing um, and the dynamic. The second piece is job embedded. So coaching, it's, it's very important. I mentioned it's practical, right? It's not theoretical and it's not divorced from the workplace the way some people might think that it is. I oftentimes use the analogy of <clears throat> a lot of leader development programs occur in, in some very nice offsite um, location where it's a bit of a, a Zen garden. And, and these leaders, you know, they have a, a nice time and they learn theories of leadership, but they're not bringing it back to their workplace. Coaching kind of exists uh, in the arena of work. It's not in this nice Zen garden-like setting. It's, it's very practical and it's embedded within your work. And then the last piece we like about this definition is that behavioral piece, corrects or reinforces behavior. So the goal of coaching, again, is to impact behavior. You can gain all the self-awareness in the world, um, but if it doesn't translate to action and performance, it's really difficult to justify the effectiveness of that coaching. So we've all had coaches in our lives and I've put a few examples on this slide for you all. And I invite you all to just think about a coach you've had before and whether they've met the definition that we provided above. I think you'll find that you, you might've had some people who kind of fancied themselves as coaches, 
But when you're looking through this definition, you kind of questioning, were they really? Or you might have had relationships with people who were not in, you know, traditional coaching roles or manager roles. But looking back, you can say, you know, they did a good amount of coaching with me. And that's really the beauty of coaching as well. It's that anyone can be a coach. So to clarify a bit more, here's a, a, a nice slide that breaks down what coaching is and what coaching is not. And I'm also interested to hear as you read through this list, are there any other misconceptions about coaching that, that you may have heard? And again, I invite you to, to type those into the chat or maybe if there's one on the list, the misconception list um, that you've heard quite a bit, um, feel free to add that in the chat as well. And we'll have a quick discussion. Ellie, is there any coaching myth that you've heard perhaps more than others or any new ones that we haven't talked about? Hmm. Something that's coming up for me based on the coach program I'm undergoing is this tension between coaching and consulting. And it's it's striking to me, uh, many of my peer learners are in consulting related roles. And indeed, Kyle, you and I are solutions consultants at BetterUp, right? Our job is to, to make recommendations. And it's really interesting how that desire to be the expert in the room, which is honed through over the years, can conflict with a coaching style, right? Embodying coaching behaviors. And I uh, just wanted to call out that tension that I feel in my own work as I feel, as I grapple with what I should be versus what I want to be. Yeah, thank you for sharing. That is a juxtaposition of roles, I would say. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. I had a comment from Mary around yeah, regulation where any anyone can say they're a coach without necessarily having training. Yeah, there there are certain you know coaching, coaching standards. Bless you. There are certain um, standards and certifications that coaches go through, and we work mostly with ICF certified coaches at BetterUp. Um, but yeah, there is this this concept that anyone can walk off the street and become an effective coach, but that's certainly not the case. Right. Also, just building on that, this awareness that yeah. while we may not all be certified coaches and oughtn't declare ourselves such, we can all interact with others in ways that are characterized by a few core behaviors that we'll be talking about and practicing. And we've seen a lot of organizations that we partner with at BetterUp really embracing this idea of manager as coach. And Having coaching is a wonderful way to shift one's behavior to be a manager coach. And we look forward to practicing more of that today. And, and thank you, Mary, for, for that great chat contribution. Yeah, thanks, Allie. That's a great segue into you know, applying it to your day-to-day. -day. Um, and what, what you see here is... is the range of conversations that really you might see yourself having in an everyday, everyday work day. And these conversations include behaviors that range from more to less directive. And so what, what do I mean by more and less directive? Well, those, those kind of directive conversations you see on the left side of the screen, those are where you're pushing information or, or direction to another person. So you can see telling or instructing is kind of the most directive we can get in our conversations. Those non-directive or less directive conversations, that's where you're pulling ideas and information um, from another person. And that's where we find coaching. It's very non-directive in that way. So it's, it's obvious that you know, different conversations are suited to different situations and different approaches resonate more with, with different people and different situations. So when you know your people as individuals and know their likes and dislikes and how they prefer to, be, to interact, 
it will really be easier for you to choose an approach that works best for them. And that's the goal here, right? A good example would be, you know, a, a new employee who's still learning the ropes, still learning their job. A more directive conversation might be uh, the best approach there. On the, on the opposite side, you know, if you have a, an employee who's having a difficult time with their performance um, or having some kind of struggle, you know, that more non-directive coaching conversation is really what you'd want to employ there. So keep these in mind as certainly as we practice these skills a little bit later. So why coaching? We've, we've talked about the what and the how, what about the why? When we dive into the outcomes from coaching, we really see benefits at the individual team and organizational levels. And I think the individual benefits are, are pretty obvious, but what's really exciting is we see these ripple effects coming from coaching where a leader or a team member brings those insights that they learned um, and the coaching behaviors that they experienced in their one-on-one -on -one sessions with their coach or with their manager, and they bring it into their teams. So it's a really exciting kind of way that that coaching can spread and you can create a coaching culture through one person just learning uh, how to interact in a more coaching manner. The other piece that's important is that coaching conversations build trust, right? We know this. We know that trust is of utmost importance at work and we know from decades of research that strong relationships built on trust lead to positive outcomes at work. And we've got a few of those outcomes listed for you here. You know, increased creativity and innovation, problem solving because people feel safe to bring up risks or, or difficult challenges, personal growth, high performance. You know, there's a lot of benefits that all stem from that trusting conversation. All right, I'd like to shift now to the second portion of our conversation today. This is where we'll actually get into what are those skills, those fundamental skills that you need to become a more effective coach. And I'll start with this framework. It, it helps to have an organizing framework for coaching. And that might seem a bit counterintuitive because coaching, as we talked about, it's personalized, it's relationship oriented but really approaching a coaching relationship with a model in mind or a framework in mind can help you become more purposeful with those interactions. And what we recommend is the GROW model, which has four key components. It's got goal, reality, options, and wrap up. So I'll go through these quickly and pass it over to Ali in a bit here. But this is how you might apply the, the GROW model. And I'll flip through each one in turn. So the first piece is goal. And this is really establishing what the person wants to get out of their coaching session or out of this conversation that's meant to be a coaching conversation. You can see some of the key questions that really frame your conversation. What do you want to achieve? What's the idea you had in mind? And what are your overall objectives? It helps you know, get those juices flowing and helps people start to think about what they want to get out of the session. Then you transition into the here and now, you transition into reality. So in this stage, you let the coachee tell their story and you invite a bit of self-assessment while they're telling their story. You know, what, what's happening right now? When does this happen? What effect does it have on me as a person and other things? And you can see some of the key questions here. You know, where are you now? What is your reality or what are you striving for? And asking for that self-assessment. Oftentimes here, you would have some kind of um, assessment that you could debrief with the individual it could be a 360, but you could also just invite an honest self-assessment and, and talk about it. You don't need to necessarily have something on paper to ground. The third piece is options. So this is brainstorming options together. And the important piece at this stage is to ask, do not tell. So it gets back to the whole self-exploration and not giving advice necessarily. You really want to empower them and ensure that they know they have the choice by asking the kind of questions like, what can you do to bridge this gap? What are your options? Um, who can help you? Really start to brainstorm. How do I put my plan into action? And then spinning off of that, the final piece is this wrap up. So the important piece to this step is gaining a commitment to a course of action and really agreeing on some kind of implementation of, of new behaviors. And here, you really want to close out by, you know, getting a solid commitment about next steps. You know, you will schedule XYZ meeting 
for next week, you'll discuss X, Y, Z and want to come out crystal clear on, on what the next steps are here. So this is the GROW model. Again, incredibly effective, incredibly important to come in with some kind of framing in your mind rather than being completely open-ended with these coaching conversations, but thought we'd share that. And through the GROW model, you know, you really want this to be your goal. You're not necessarily offering a crutch to anyone, but instead you're helping them discover that they're resourceful, they're creative, and they're perfectly capable of achieving their goals. And you can do this by practicing these three very, very important coaching skills that we're really gonna spend the rest of the time chatting about here. So the first skill that Ali will go through is listen to understand. And that's really about making a conscious effort to hear you know, not only the words that an individual is saying, but more importantly, trying to understand that complete message. And you do that by paying full attention, recognizing verbal and nonverbal cues, and really avoiding distractions in your conversation with them. The second piece that I'll cover is asking powerful questions. These are open-ended questions that invite clarity, action, discovery, and they allow for expanded learning and some fresh perspective for your coachee. And then the third piece is that driving action. That's the final component. So to make that coaching conversation especially impactful, you need to move from that discovery and that brainstorming into action. So each coaching conversation, again, needs to end with an agreed upon commitment to a course of action and next steps. So let's spend some time walking through these one by one, and I'll pass it over to Allie to cover Listen to Understand. Thanks, Kyle. And just as we're laying this groundwork for what a conversation looks like, a coaching conversation, that is. And Kyle, thank you so much for talking about that grow structure, that it's such a helpful framework for thinking about the beginning, middle, and end of a coaching conversation. And these, these are intended just to be a bit bigger picture about all of this for a moment, to be ways that you can embrace and practice in your work worlds and beyond, incorporate into the goals you're setting in within Berkeley and beyond, talk to your colleagues, your manager, whomever else is a relevant stakeholder here about what you want to work on and so that they can start giving you feedback on the extent to which they perceive you doing these things. So I would just really encourage you to be thinking about how can I incorporate these pieces into my work, let people know that I care about this, that this is important to me, because that's such a, a direct way to, to demonstrate um, commitment to this path and enlist others as, as accountability partners in your coaching journey. And uh, it's also quite likely to bolster performance perceptions as well. So it can be a very helpful strategy as we want to be perceived more favorably at work and beyond. So with that, with that as a background, I'd love to, to go deeper into this idea of listening, which I know is top of mind to many of you. You cited early in this, um, when I ask you what gets in the way of us having good coaching conversations, you said listening failures. And um, I'll quote um, Brene Brown, who is emerging as I no doubt many of you know, is a very popular voice in um, thinking about positive psychological applications of listening techniques and beyond. And just reiterating this core point that Carol, that, um, excuse me, Kyle, <laughs> sorry, Kyle, <laughs> um, that, that Kyle teed up, that, that we're seeking here to listen, to understand, just as we so very much, so very deeply want to be understood, right? This is about a norm of reciprocity here. And uh, let's, let's go a bit deeper. So what we're gonna do is um, a quiz, little quiz, right? This is, right, we, we talked about coaching and its relationship with self-awareness. And so I'd love for you to indulge Kyle and I here and, and respond honestly, authentically about your behavioral tendencies in a number of domains. And the context for responding here is 
what you tend to do when someone is talking to you. So if um, this applies to you, you know, please take note, jot it down, think, get a pen and paper handy in terms of are these part of your way of being or not right now? So the first is when someone is talking, I plan how I'm going to respond. Is that you? Yes or no? Next, when someone is talking, I watch for significant body language. Is that something you do? Yes or no? Next, when someone's talking, you ask questions to get more information and encourage the speaker to say more. Kyle, we can go ahead and put the rest of these forward. Thanks. When someone's talking, do you find yourself thinking about other things? Do you interrupt the speaker to make a point? Do you repeat what you've just heard to ensure understanding? And you're an incredibly keen audience. That's <laughs> so evident from the quality of your responding. And so you're like, Allie, come on, this differential color coding, obviously <laughs> it's a giveaway. And I, I um, was off a bit in terms of those slide canes there. I apologize. And, and what I'd, I'd love for someone to come off mute and, and explain to us is what's the difference? What's the difference? between items one, five, and six here, and two, three, four, and seven. Is anyone comfortable weighing in on that? What's the difference? I think um, that speaks to a lack of active listening. A lot of it seems like you're thinking in, about your response and not really sitting there and considering what the other person is saying. Thanks, Anthony. So to paraphrase back what I heard from you, you're suggesting that one, five, and seven are frankly failures in active listening. Is that fair? That's fair. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. You're spot on, right? This, this is anti-active listening. And this is what we do so much of, right? right? It's, it's so very natural to think when you're in the midst of a conversation to turn the focus back to you and what am I gonna say next? Am I gonna say it crisply and concisely, right? Can I speak before I forget it, right? The mind wanders. Right? And yet those are true failures in active listening. Those are the antithesis of, of what's foundational to coaching, okay, to having a coaching conversation. And these other pieces, I think that's, I, Anthony, I'm so grateful to you for hopping in there, applaud it. Thank you so much. And, and those other pieces, they might feel funny, right? Like, especially the watching for significant body language. Did anyone feel a hint of surprise at seeing that on there? that attention to another's body. Curious, feel free to type in the chat or Kyle, what did, what's your reaction when you first learned about this body language piece? The body language piece, my mind goes to our current environment of, you know, Zoom, Zoom meetings and, and web and webinars and Zoom fatigue. So you don't have the full picture when people are, are standing in front of you and folks can be so run down, you know, Ali, you had 15 meetings yesterday. I don't know if meeting number one, you were as crisp and fresh as you were for meeting number 15, but for most people, you know, that's not the case. So when you're interpreting body language, you know, there's a lot more you need to take into account now that we're in this virtual environment. And that's what, that's what jumps out to me about that one. Yeah. 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 So thanks Kyle. And some great chats building upon this too. The body language one, 
stands out, I think, compared to some others in terms of, of um, it feels, can feel funny. And yet why it's valuable and how it embodies active listening is this recognition that there's value in getting out of this cognitive realm, the realm of the mind and connecting with others more deeply. And coaching is about connection, caring enough to try to connect more deeply, more authentically, and paying attention to others' posture, leaning forward or subtle signs of dis disengagement. This clenched right, or open, turning away versus gazing in. Those are all things that, that patterns that tell us something and size, you know, I know people who sigh. Yeah, joy, totally. Changes in tone of voice. These are all tells that just help us pay attention to more than the words, right? Because I think this happens, especially you're like, oh, I got to listen better. Words, 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 right? Meaning, meaning. There's more to it than, than that cognitive aspect. So much is said by how we position our bodies right, relative to one another. And I know it's been hard in this virtual space and we're finding more and more urging us to turn our cameras off. And indeed, it's still, you can pick up right, the sighs, the pauses, the gulps, right, the silence, the pace. Right? It's more than the words. Sometimes it's the non-words. Appreciate the opportunity to elaborate on that. Also this, I'll, I'll elaborate a bit on the last point as well, the value of repetition or paraphrasing. I think it can often, there can be environments in which we feel as though if you repeat what you've just heard to ensure understanding, there can be fear that you're not perceived as super quick on the uptake, right? Or not sharp enough to have gotten it the first time. And that's so at odds with the spirit of coaching conversations we're talking about that, that paraphrasing, repeating back, that, that's a key part of connecting, ensuring un understanding so there's clarity and a firm foundation from which to move forward. So repetition has a ton of value. Thanks for letting me linger here. Any questions or points that people would like to probe per further? Feel free to ask or come up or put it in chat. Cool. And we we um happy to take more questions as well later on. Kyle, let's go forward. Right. Let's pop one forward further. I wanted to um, introduce you. I won't linger here too long. I want to be mindful of our time and, and just say that motivational interviewing, if active listening is an, an area of, of deep interest to you, I encourage you to go into the realm of motivational interviewing, which gives us some frameworks that help us really understand on a deeper level these what it means to actively listen. And, and this idea of listening with our whole body is huge here too, as we're thinking about the how deep we can go in the active listening space. I was encouraging you to pay attention to others' body language. And this, this third step, this third level of listening, where which, which is the truest embodiment of active listening, um, noting others' language, the sensing and tuning into what's said and not said, that's active listening. It's more than words. You're like, Alia, you've repeated yourself enough. <laughs> Will the song More Than Words be stuck in your head? I don't know. <laughs> let's, let's go one more forward, Kyle. And, and then on a deeply practical note, this creating the space to listen right, in our virtual environment, which you've acknowledged, right, there are some just simple must-dos when having a coaching conversation. And a really basic one is turning off your notifications so there aren't like pings and dings and, and various other sounds coming in. And also having a notepad handy because so often we get distracted by an idea and we don't want to lose it. So have a place where you can quickly capture that and stay in that listening space. Back to you, Kyle. 
Thanks, Ali. The second piece we wanted to chat about is asking powerful questions. So listening, such an important foundational skill. How do you then transition and start to interact by asking powerful questions to get to the heart of the matter with, with who you're speaking to? We have a, a quote from Peter Drucker here. It's a, it's a nice quote around the dangers of asking wrong questions, the wrong question. I'll, I'll reframe it a bit to be more positively written. So by asking powerful and insightful questions, you're really framing the rest of the conversation and, and you're setting the person that you're speaking to on a path towards self-discovery. That, that's the power of, of asking the right questions. It's, it's really a, a jumping off point in which you can explore many different topics with someone. So what's so powerful about asking questions? When I was doing a bit of research on this, there's actually a lot of research suggesting that asking good questions actually increases your likability, which is pretty funny. So the next time you're at a networking event, maybe skip the long-winded story and just sit back and listen to someone and ask questions, more detailed questions around their story. And that might be a way for, for folks to, to like you a bit more. But kidding aside, in the context of coaching, you know, questions can do so much to build a relationship and, and really help spark insight within the person that you're speaking to. This is a list of, of you know, the powerful outcomes that come from asking good questions. I particularly like surfacing those underlying assumptions. I don't know about you all, but, but I can't tell you how many times I've been on a meeting with, with a group and you kind of meander along until you reach a point where you realize you weren't on the same page from the very beginning, or you have different, completely different perspectives or expectations, and, and you have to just do a complete reset. So it's, it's usually a question that, that uncovers these discrepancies in perspectives or, or in expectations. So to the extent that you can really uncover these discrepancies through asking powerful questions, I would say the better, and it will really help you um, at work and in life. So what are powerful questions? First off, they can't be answered yes or no. So they're open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are like a secret weapon. Um, they, they invite more information and more ideas from the other people, and they're just so powerful at, at getting to the heart of the matter with, with someone else. They also encourage dialogue um, and they broaden other people's thinking. So it enables a lot, of, a lot of outcomes like creative thinking, reflection, problem solving. These are, are great ways, open-ended questions are a great way to, to get to that. Now there, you can obviously start your question with in a number of different ways, right? And so the, the way that you phrase it has a huge impact on, on what your colleagues might think and how they might respond. So for example, what questions, they're, they're great because they really expand people's thinking. They get people thinking about all of the potential possibilities and creative solutions. So when you're brainstorming or when you're problem solving, what questions are really powerful in that way? How questions are powerful because they get people to think tactically. How might I approach this problem or, or challenge and how might I solve it? What might my next steps be? How would I go about doing that? How questions are great for framing it in that way. And then why questions, very useful for digging into purpose or, or root causes of, a, of an issue. You've probably heard of the Socratic method where you ask why, 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 several times until people get to the heart of the matter. And this has been translated into a business setting with a, a, the five whys activity, with the, with the reasoning that by the, by the last why, by the fifth why, you get at the true heart of the matter that you were originally discussing because you might just be discussing the symptoms of the problem, right? The one thing I'll say about why questions is, you know, they could make someone defensive, like they're being challenged or they need to defend themselves. So exercising a little bit of caution with the why questions is always wise. We've collected a Oh, sorry, Ali. Go ahead. No, no problem. Sorry to interject. I was just thinking that um, on that spirit of why questions, it can be very tempting. Like when people are are in the coaching conversation mode, they're like, oh, I need to correct some, uh, I need to give some negative feedback or constructive feedback. And I need to do it right now because I know I need to give timely feedback. And so 
what can happen is the question, why did you do that it, in re reaction to a negative performance act can come out. That's not a particularly effective question. Granted, it's open-ended, but it causes that defensiveness Kyle referenced. And so we would turn it around to what might you do differently next time? That's forward-looking, less inclined to generate defensiveness. Absolutely, absolutely. You, uh, you jumped into our activity a little bit, which is great. Uh, you segged nicely into that. But before that, I just wanted to share some sample powerful questions that, that you can jot down or, or take note of when you get this presentation that you might want to employ in your day-to-day -day interactions to, to help with that. But the activity I wanted to walk through with you all is a little bit of practice around problem, around powerful questions. So our examples here, we have what Ali just mentioned, right? Why did you do that? If you're asked, why did you do that? How are you, how would you take that? What were you thinking? Another question. And do you have everything you need for the project? These are just three sample questions we have. And I would pose it back to the group. Are these powerful questions? Just add a yes or a no in the chat. Or is one perhaps a powerful question, the others aren't? It's looking like folks are saying no, is that right, Ali? Lots and lots and lots of no's, Kyle. <laughs> that is right. So <laughs> what I'd like to do with you all is, is how would we rephrase each question? And Ali got us started with translating, why did you do that to how would you do that differently? And as she said, that's very forward thinking, it's a how question that really opens the door for exploration as to what they would do differently. Um, how about the next two? Let's start with what were you thinking? How would you rephrase that one? That's actually a difficult one to rephrase because at first glance, I, I thought, you know, yeah, what were you thinking? Walk me through your thought process might be a decent question. But how would you rephrase that to be even more powerful? All right. yeah, we've got some great options coming in. We're rephrasing the question, what were you thinking to, what was your decision-making process in this scenario? Ooh, Can you share okay. your thoughts? What did you learn from that? How would you do that differently? Fantastic. I love what did you learn from that? Kind of a, a retroactive look at, at what you would take out of that experience. How about the last question? Do you have everything you need for the project? This is a question that, you know, I, I could see a lot of managers asking a new employee or someone who just started on a project. Do you have everything you need? Just a quick, and I've often heard it. It's funny in that context, just as if it wasn't really even meant to, uh, to be answered in depth. Do you have everything you need? Like it's just spat out at you, right? So what are thoughts on how you'd rephrase, do you have everything you need? Oh, some really nice suggestions coming in. What else do you need for this project? How can I support you? What tools are you expecting to receive need? How can I help you become successful or meet your goals? Do you need anything else? What are some tools and resources you will need? Yeah, so open-ended, encouraging specificity. Love it. Yeah, I see one from Ad Adriana. What are your needs for the project and what needs are not yet met? That's, that's a fantastic question. And I like, I like to, to ask those questions when I'm working with anyone on a, on a new project, like, what are you really wanting to get out of this? What's, what's the experience that you want? So we can frame the rest of the project in that way. So thanks for, for practicing that with me. Much appreciated. We'll dive into our last topic here with, gosh, seven minutes to go. Where did the time go, Allie? Um, we'll be talking about drive action. So I'll pass it over to Allie. Sure. Thanks, Kyle. And I was just reminded of, of, um, a study I read about a year ago where I um, was looking at the frequency of questions elicited by one of two prompts. Do you have any questions or what questions do you have? And what questions do you have elicited far more questions? And so that's a go-to standard and in now inclusive classrooms and effective pedagogy and effective meeting running, right? What questions do you have? Yeah. So we've talked about talked about 
um, active listening. We've talked about the power of powerful questions. And our third and final takeaway here from a skill that you can practice to have better and more frequent coaching conversations is this driving to action. And a key component of, of behaving as a coach is to prime and encourage that action orientation, right? Focusing your attention on what's important for the other person, not you, and then instilling them with that responsibility to take action, right? That is a key part of this grow model in terms of how we end the conversation, right? It wasn't just a nice chat. This is how we ensure that it drives to impact by priming action, right? And it sits with the person acting as coach to, to move that other toward having the responsibility to take action. So let's, let's go a bit deeper into that. So we all know taking action is not necessarily the easiest thing. It can be so much more tempting to, set, to sit and fret and ruminate, right? But a key part of action, that drive to action, is ending with clear agreement. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, clarity is kindness. And so this is really bringing that to life in terms of when you're winding down a co coaching conversation, you've done the, the listening, you get it, you've had the questions, right? Um, how you end is so important. And the, what a good ending looks like is clarity on what's next, who's responsible for what, when will that occur? And then the next steps for follow-up. I think most of us know this in terms of effective meeting facilitation. We don't just say, oh, it's time we got to go, right? It's about how do we wind this down in a meaningful way to move forward, right? And there are, um, these are the ways we can do that. I love this, this pithy little quote here in terms of best conversations are won or lost at the very end. This can be why the time management piece is so critical in terms of how we end. So I just invite you as you're thinking about weaving coaching conversations into your regular practice with your team members is that careful planning of, of, of a time bound approach to like five minutes at minimum at the end of that coaching conversation.